So in our previous video, we concluded our understanding of one part of the sarclade, um, and that was the stramenopiles. We're going to continue looking at the sarclade by looking at the next part of the sarclade called the alveolate. So remember, S-A-R, each of them stands for a subdivision of the clade uh, in general. So we'll talk about sarclade, continue talking about sarclade, one, two, three now. And now we're going to focus on the A. We did the stramenopiles. Now we're going to do the alveolates. The alveolates also have three types, and we'll actually get through all three types in this flowchart. So there are three types of alveolates to remember. Um, and again, first and foremost, we have to characterize these guys. They're characterized by alveoli, thus the name, alveolates. And what are alveoli? Alveoli, just remember them as flattened vesicles. They're flattened vesicles, uh, usually found inside the plasma membrane for support. Inside PM for plasma membrane for support. So essentially, alveoli support structures within the plasma membrane. So all alveolates, uh, most of them are characterized and have the alveoli structure within them. So let's talk about the three types. The three types to remember are the following. First one to remember are the dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates, okay? Diflagellates. Think of what they probably have. These are uh, seen uh, in figure 28.15. So I suggest uh, looking at all these figures that I'm mentioning because once you get a visualization of these protists, you really start to appreciate the complexity and the diversity associated with each of these small microscopic organisms. Most of them are small, at least. Um, for dinoflagellates, these are mostly unicellular. So again, we can never really say all or completely, but mostly unicellular in their structure, cellular structure, with cellulose plates for support. So they have cellulose plates within their cell walls, uh, plasma membranes specifically actually within uh, for support. So we'll write that down for for support, and that's within the plasma membrane. We'll write that down in parentheses just so we're clear. Okay, so mostly unicellular with cellulose for support. That's in the plasma membrane. Um, in addition, these are characterized by like I alluded to before, so CHAR for characterized by two flagella for movement. So when you look at these under a microscope, you will notice their characteristic double flagella. Let me spell flagella correctly at least. Flagella for movement. Of course, that's what flagella are useful for. So two flagella dinoflagellates, thus the name. Uh, the classic example seen in every uh, biology course for dinoflagellates um, are the bloom example that people always refer to. And it's of importance to humans because it's actually a result of human uh, negligence, at least. And I'll explain that right now. So what are blooms and what are dinoflagellates? What do they have to do with these blooms? Blooms are a population explosion, population explosion, a huge amount of population growth, more so than normal, of dinoflagellates. Okay, big deal. So what? If we have lots of dinoflagellates, what is that going to do for us as humans? This actually causes something known as red tide. This causes red tide. Your textbook has a good figure of red tide. And red tide is due to the carotenoids seen within these individuals, this accessory pigment. So that would tell you automatically what type of uh, photos, uh, I told you already, but what type of cell process do they do? They probably do photosynthesis. Uh, red tie due to carotenoids, okay? So their carotenoids give off this red color on the tide specifically. Now, when does this happen? This happens uh, due to coastal pollution. It's a telltale sign that the pollution levels of this coast, of the water, within or near this coast are polluted, okay, are, are highly polluted. And because of that, you get this red tide that shows up on the ocean, uh, let's say, next to, usually by the beach, actually. And it's a very, very characteristic, very easy to see. Your textbook shows it very nicely. Um, what's the big deal, then? So what? It's red. What problem does that have? Well, it creates a big problem. It actually releases neurotoxins. 
releases neurotoxins. Who releases the neurotoxins? The dinoflagellates themselves. When they're in this great population explosion, they collectively release neurotoxins, and this neurotoxin release actually kills fish. It directly affects fish nervous systems, so it kills fish. And because it kills fish, who eats fish by the shore? That's usually going to be birds. Birds will consume these contaminated fish, these neurotoxin contaminated fish, and they themselves will become sick and they will die as well by eating the fish. So this stepwise pattern that we see, this ecological uh, ladder that we have here is of great importance to us because we need to prevent this. We need to prevent this by limiting coastal pollution and thus limiting the presence of these blooms seen with dinoflagellates. So that covers our first alveolate, dinoflagellates. Second one to remember are the apicocomplexins, okay? Apicocomplexins. These are parasites. These are always, almost, uh, almost always, at least to my knowledge, parasites of animals. And you already know about an apicocomplexin, uh, you just don't know that it's called that yet. These are characteristic parasites of animals. Um, this is because of their apicocomplexes, okay? Uh, that's why their name is apicocomplexins. Great name for uh, a very, very parasitic organism. So they're characterized by their apical complex, which I'll explain in just a second. So they have these things called an apical complex. And an apical complex is used, uh, it's useful for the apical complexin because it's something that penetrates host cells. Why would that be useful? Well, that's because you're a parasite. You need to get into the host cell, hack the machinery, and use and abuse it uh, almost until death, or at least close to death as possible because of your parasitic plus minus relationship with your host. Apical complexins have an incredibly complex life cycle. People devote their entire PhD thesis to studying apical complexin life cycles. Um, a great example of this, that is definitely something you should remember and something you probably already know about, just don't know the name to it yet, is plasmodium. Plasmodium is an apical complexin. And an apical complexin is an alveoli, and an alveoli is a part of the sarclade, and a sarclade organism is a protist and thus a eukaryote. So a plasmodium, being a eukaryote, actually is the direct cause and exactly what causes malaria. People think malaria is caused by mosquitoes, but malaria is not caused directly by mosquitoes. It's caused by mosquitoes being the vector, the method of transfer of this protist, that gets into people's blood upon mosquito bites. So mosquitoes carry plasmodium within them. Plasmodium gets transferred to humans, and when plasmodium gets transferred to humans, it causes malaria within us. Malaria is the single greatest cause of human death in recent history, at least. About 1, 1 to 3 million uh, deaths per year. So that's uh, of great, great uh, importance to us as uh, people who are studying biology. Plasmodium is something to understand. It's important to dissect this complex life cycle to really try to combat the plasmodium that we see. Um, to see this complex life cycle, definitely don't suggest memorizing this, but just appreciate how complex this life cycle is for a single cell parasite um, that's a protist. And figure 28.16 shows you how it goes through the entire human body to cause malaria. Very, very powerful uh, figure, at least in my opinion. And finally, last one to cover in terms of the alveolates, which are part of the sarclade, are the ciliates. Ciliates are characterized by cilia, not too hard to remember, uh, characterized by cilia. And what are cilia? Cilia are used to move and feed. They're small projections used to move and feed. To move plus feed. Remember how we said eukaryotes have complex feeding and moving mechanisms? Cilia are a great example of that. Um, uh, look at figure 28.17a to understand this movement of cilia, how they function and what they really look like. Um, cilia are actually going to be protists that use asexual reproduction. They use asexual reproduction via a uh, classic asexual reproductive mechanism known as binary fission, something we studied in the prokaryotes lecture. So binary fission is asexual. It's the first time we see it, so it's something you should probably remember about ciliates. But another thing you should remember about ciliates is that they're actually capable, capable of conjugation. 
just like bacteria. So they're very, very uh, similar to bacteria in terms of their reproductive capabilities and their genetic transfer capabilities. This is simply going to be conjugation, if we remember, a sexual exchange. This is a sexual exchange, usually via a pillus in prokaryotes, uh, of haploid macronuclei, of haploid uh, micronuclei, excuse me, micro nuclei. So they exchange some genetic material essentially through conjugative processes. One thing to remember about conjugation, don't forget this about conjugation, conjugation, sorry, it does not result in reproduction. Don't reproduce like this, okay? Don't, uh, let me spell that correctly, don't uh, repro for reproduce. Don't reproduce via conjugation. Conjugation is just exchanging genes. It's not sexual uh, um, reproduction. It's actually just a moment of gene exchange. Okay, so we'll write that, write that down. Only, 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 only exchange of genes. That's it. It's just a gene exchange. It's not going to result in a um, baby ciliate, let's say. Okay, um, and that covers the dinoflagellates, the apical complexins, the ciliates, all of which are alveolates. Alveolates are the A in the sarclade. The sarclade is the second supergroup of the eukaryotes, and the eukaryotes consists of the protists as well. Be very comfortable doing what I just did right there. We'll conclude the next video. Uh, we'll conclude the sarclade in the next video with the rhizarians.